Hello, in this tutorial, uh, we are going to go through a working example of how to model uh, a building with a steel concentrically braced frames uh, using uh, FM2D. So I will go uh, right ahead and from my desktop, I already have a shortcut for FM2D. So I will go ahead and run it. Uh, just remember when you run FM2D, uh, you must make sure that you run it as an administrator. Uh, this is essential in order for FM2D to be able to write uh, and read files uh, from the installation directory. So I will go ahead and run it. Now, when, F when FM2D uh, runs, you will always have the command shell window over here which is very useful because from this we can track the background operations all the things happening in the background in FM2D uh, and if there is any problem or any data that's being visualized it will appear over here so now I have the main console already initiated so I will put this to the side over here and uh, now so the first step uh, is to start a new project and before I start with a new project uh, let me go through the the example building that we are trying to model today so let me open it right here so basically this is the example building uh, in our case and uh, if I look in the plan view so this is the plan view so I have a building that has a plan a layout of 180 feet by 120 feet uh, in each orthogonal direction I have concentrically braced frames indicated here with the red lines so I have two in each orthogonal direction uh, if I look at the elevation over here I can see the elevation of the concentrically braced frames which is a one bay braced frame that has an X bracing layout and here I can see the uh, the bay width which is 30 feet I can see the different heights of each story uh, over here I can see the cross sections for uh, the beams and uh, the columns and the braces uh, of the braced frame uh, what are we trying to do today we are trying to analyze this building in the east-west direction so I'm trying to look in this east-west direction. So this is what we are going to do uh, today. So uh, let me go ahead and start a new project. By starting a new project, the first thing is to uh, specify the name of the project and the location to save uh, our project. So I will go to the desktop here. And uh, I will just call this uh, CBF building example. And then I will click Save. And as I mentioned uh, in FM2D, uh, a project is saved as a MATLAB data file that's which has an extension .mat. So I will save this. And then. Uh, before the project is initiated, I will need to select the type of frame, the lateral uh, load resisting system. And in our, my case, it's a CBF, so I need to select CBF. And then I will need to select the project units, which in our case, I'm going to use skip an inch. And uh, it's optional if you want to write any uh, project, any description for your project. Uh, something specific that you can refer to later on when you open this project so you can uh, know a little bit of details about it so this is optional for now I will just leave it like this I will not put any uh, description so I will click submit and once I will do that you will notice that I will get now on the desktop my uh, .mat file my project file pretty much will be saved on the desktop where we specified so I will go ahead and click submit so now I get it over here, I get the .mat file with the name of the project. I see here on my 
on the main console. Now it says project CVF building example. And uh, once we submitted this, now I have the first part of defining my project has been activated, which is defining the modeling parameters. So in FM2D, you need to define three things in sequence, the model parameters, the building parameters, and the analysis parameters. So the first thing that we need to do right now is defining the model parameters. So if I click on model parameters, you will get the module over here for defining the model parameters. Uh, and let's see here. So the first thing that I've been asked is, are you going, what type of geometric transformation are you going to consider in your model? Uh, pretty much this geometric transformation will be assigned to the beams and columns in my frame. So you have uh, the three basic options, the one that you have also in uh, OpenSeas, so either a linear geometric transformation, P-delta or co-rotational. So I will use, in this case, just the P-delta, which is already the default uh, transformation. For the numerical model type, you can choose either a linear elastic model, and here linear refers to material nonlinearity, uh, not the geometric one, because the geometric one we already specified. So this is the material nonlinearity. So you either run a linear elastic model or a nonlinear model. So in our case, we want to run a nonlinear model. Now you need to select you have four modeling considerations that you either activate or disregard. So the first thing is whether or not to consider the panel zone deformation. As we know, the column uh, web, which is at the junction of the beam to column connection, will undergo some deformation. And here uh, you are asked whether to consider this deformation or just assume that the panel zone is rigid. In our case, we are going to consider the panel zone deformation because sometimes it can be important. So I will select this to include. The second thing, whether uh, or not to include the rigid floor diaphragm, to consider a rigid floor diaphragm, which means that in my model, all the points at a given floor level will be tied together to move uh, laterally in the same uh, magnitude. So this is a rigid for the right frame consideration. Now the other two considerations here, first is the gravity framing system. And as we mentioned, if we look in our building again, you will see that you have your CBF over here, the one that you are trying to model, the lateral four resisting system, the main one. But in the same time, you have all these uh, space network of gravity beams and gravity columns that also contribute to the strength and stiffness of the building. So you are being asked over here whether to consider it, these contributions, or to ignore it. In my case, I will select just for the case, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, covering all the aspects, so I will select that I want to include the gravity framing system. And when you choose to, uh, to consider it, you will need to specify the orientation of the columns with respect to the direction that you are being analyzing. Is it a weak axis orientation or a strong axis orientation? Well, what does this mean? Again, if I'm looking at this CBF, so we are looking into this direction, the east-west direction. So with respect to the east-west direction, the columns, the gravity columns, all these ones over here, they are oriented with respect to the weak axis. So if this building is being pushed in the east-west direction, left and right, so these columns are being uh, deformed with respect to their weak axis. So in this case, I will select a weak axis orientation. Of course, whether it's weak or strong axis orientation, this will affect the strength and the stiffness of uh, the gravity framing system. So uh, I will choose here a weak axis orientation. 
And the last thing, whether or not you want to consider the composite action of the floor slab. So assuming that in your building, at each floor, you have a composite floor slab, uh, a concrete floor slab that's acting in a com uh, compositely with the steel beams. So in this case, the composite action will affect the beam behavior, it will affect the panel zone behavior and the connections behavior, strength and stiffness of course, and uh, deformation ductility. So if you want to consider that, then you can select this over here. And then if you want to consider the composite action, uh, of course, then you will need to specify some things like for instance, you need to include the floor slab dimension and the thickness of the slab. So the thickness of the slab here, I'm assuming it's four inches, four inches, uh, which is around 10 centimeter. Uh, and this is the thickness of the steel deck. So this is assuming that you have uh, a concrete slab over a steel deck type of uh, uh, flooring system. So this is the thickness of the rib. Uh, and here I'm assuming it's 3.5 inches, but you can change those values if you want to. Uh, you also need to specify the stiffness coefficients. And these are pretty much the coefficient that will be multiplied by the bare steel stiffness of the beams of the main frame and the stiffness of the gravity beams in order to compute the stiffness of uh, the composite beams. So the ones I'm using here are 1.4 uh, and these are the ones based on uh, a res research that has been conducted uh, uh, that you can find uh, if you go to the manual so you can refer to the uh, reference where these values come from. So that's it with respect to the modeling options, uh, what we want to consider. The second thing that we can look at is the files and folders. So if I click on this other tab, uh, so by default, once we created uh, our project automatically the result folder uh, name and location is specified here so since we already uh, put our project on the desktop so by default the results uh, folder the output that we are going to get after the analysis will automatically be saved in the same location if you want to change that however you can click on the browse here button and change the location I will leave this as it is. I will keep it in the desktop. Uh, the other thing is the OpenSeas file name. So again, when we run the analysis, then FM2D will create uh, an OpenSeas TCL file for the numerical model. So this is the name of this file. So again, automatically, uh, the name of this file is the same as the project name, but of course, after removing all the spaces. So I will leave those as they are, and then I will click. Uh, I'm uh, happy with everything I defined over here, so I will click Submit. So once you click Submit, that's it. So now uh, the first button turns green, meaning that it has been defined. And it says over here, uh, the text changed, this subtext changed, uh, that used to say status not defined. Now it says, that our model is nonlinear dash CG. So CG, this refers to the gravity. So the, the C refers to the composite action consideration while the G refers to the gravity uh, framing system consideration. So if we didn't include uh, either of those, like the composite action and the gravity framing system, then this would have a say dash b b referring to a bare steel uh, frame without considering uh, all the other contributions so that's fine now we have finished the first part of our three-step uh, procedure to define the project the second thing now i have this button became active which is the building parameters so now let's define our building parameters so i will click on building parameters 
So again, I have uh, four tabs over here that I need to define uh, some uh, information about my building. So in under building geometry, first you need to specify the bracing layout. And as we see here, I have an X bracing layout. So I will choose X bracing. The other option is to use a chevron that is an inverted V uh, bracing layout but in our case it's an X bracing so I will select that then I will need to specify the building geometry in units of inches because if you remember when we uh, initiated our project we selected the units to be kip and inch so this means any uh, distance or length uh, parameters need to be specified in units of inches so we are going to define those. So the first thing we need to specify the building plan dimensions. And if I open again my reference building, I see that in the plan view it's 180 feet by 120 feet. So I will need, I need to multiply these two values, the 180 and 120 by 12 and add those values. So if I do that, this value, the 180 feet, becomes 2,160 inches. And in the other direction, uh, that would be 120 feet by 12. This will give me 1440 inches. So this is the building plan dimensions. Uh, by the way, all these dimensions that we are adding over here, they are used uh, to calculate the loads uh, and the masses in our building. So this is discussed in detail what kind of formulas are used for this computation uh, in the uh, manual. Uh, the second thing is to uh, define the tributary area of the exterior MF column. So MF refers here to the main frame. So the main frame, this is the lateral load resisting system, which is the CBF in our case. So it's referred to as main frame here because it could be a CBF or it could be a moment frame, an MRF. So you need to look at the exterior column for your main frame and uh, put the tributary area. So if I open my example building again, so I'm looking in the east-west direction, I'm looking at one of those uh, frames, the main frames that I'm trying to model, and if I look at the columns, so this frame is one bay, so it has pretty much two uh, exterior columns. It doesn't have any interior columns. So it has two exterior columns, one over here and one over here. So each one of those, uh, of course, the tributary area, it will uh, service half of the lens, half of the lens to its left and half of the lens to its right and the same in this direction. So this means since the bay width is 30 feet, so this means that each column will take 15 feet and 15 feet from the other side, so this is 30 feet. And in this direction, again, the bay width is 30 feet, so it will be taking 15. So the tributary area for the exterior main frame column uh, would be 30 feet by uh, 15 feet which translate to 360 inches by 180 inches and interior uh, we don't have interior actually so I will just put it the same we don't have interior column since it's just one bay uh, frame so I will put the same tributary area for the interior. Uh, the last thing that we need to specify is the number of moment frames in the considered direction. And again, we are looking in the east-west direction. And in the east-west direction, I have two CBFs, one over here on this perimeter and another one over here. So this means that I just need to specify here the number of moment frames to be two which is already what's 
written by default, so I will keep it as it is, 2. Then, for the, moment, uh, for the main frame configuration, you need to specify the number of stories and the number of bays for the main frame. So, our main frame is 6 story high, as you can see from the elevation, and it's 1 bay in width. So we are talking here not how many bays in the building, we are talking how many bays in the mainframe only. So I will put here 6 and number of bays 1, I leave it as it is. And then for the G GFS, which is uh, the abbreviation for the gravity framing system, I need to specify the number of columns and the number of beams. That is the number of gravity columns and the number of gravity beams uh, that are making this uh, gravity framing system. So if I look here, again, uh, for the gravity column, you can start counting the uh, uh, gravity columns in your uh, building. And if you count here, so you will see that you will have in your plan view, you have a total of 27 gravity columns so I will go back and I will write 27 of course you might have noticed that not all the gravity columns are oriented with respect to their weak axis for the considered direction because some of them like those ones for instance are oriented with respect to the strong axis but this is fine for the numerical modeling purposes. You are going just to assume, which is more conservative, that pretty much all the gravity columns are oriented in the same uh, direction. Because currently, uh, uh, FM2D doesn't support uh, the option to have the gravity columns uh, oriented in uh, two different orientations simultaneously. Uh, the second thing that we need to specify is the number of uh, gravity columns, uh, gravity beams, sorry. So for the gravity beams, so the gravity beams are the ones uh, that we see over here, the one connecting the gravity columns. So you just need to count the gravity beams. And here we only care about the gravity beams in the east-west direction. So I don't care about the gravity beams connecting the framing system in this direction. I only care about these gravity beams in the considered direction. So if I count those, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 5 on the, say, on the other end. So that's a total of 10. And then intermediate, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 by 3 axes. So that's 18. So 18 plus 10, that gives me a total of 28 gravity beams in the considered direction. So I will go here and I will write the number of beams is 28. So now we have defined the basic geometry and tributary area and the basic layout, how many stories, how many bays of my building. But I haven't defined yet the member sizes the height of the stories, the widths of the bays, all the different uh, important information. So this is actually the last thing that we have over here, which is the building members. And here it says import Excel file. So I need to browse for an Excel file that contains all this information. So in FM2D, uh, we have a pre-formatted Excel file that you typically add inside it all this information in a systematic and organized way. I already have this file filled over here on the desktop, so I will open it and let's go through it uh, very quickly. Uh, what are the uh, different sheets inside it and how do we define the data? So let me open it. Okay. So as you see here, so I open now this Excel file and you can see over here that you have multiple sheets inside this Excel file. So again, you don't need to modify any of those sheets name. You need to keep everything the same. 
you just need to input uh, the values in each uh, sheet depending on your building. So for instance here, the first sheet is, it says W bay, which is basically the width of the bay of your uh, mainframe. So this is the width. Now if you have multiple bays, then you will need to put the width of each bay. Now over here I already filled it and I put here 360, which is basically the width of the bay. 30 feet by 12, which is 360 inches in the same units. So I have only one bay, so that's it. So this sheet is already uh, defined, the bay width. Similarly, then I will go to the height of the story. So again, you can have as many stories up till like 50 or even more, that's not a problem. Uh, and then you need to specify the height of each uh, floor uh, of each story. So again, if I look here in the elevation view, you will see that the ground is 0 feet, then second floor is 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90. So these are the elevation values. So if you subtract uh, each one uh, minus the previous one, you will see that typically you have uh, the same story height everywhere, which is equal to 15 feet. So 15 feet by 12, this gives me 180 inches. So I specify those for the six stories of my building. Of course, you can have different values if this is the case. Next, I need to define the main frame columns. So I need to define the main frame columns, the sections of the main frame columns. So again, now we are looking at your main frame and you have different stories. So at each story, you have a column section. And in your case, since we have one bay frame, so this means you have two axes. So again, if I open my, build, uh, my building again, so it's one bay frame. So this is axis number one over here. And this is axis number two. So I need to specify the column sections at axis number one and axis number two if they are different. So now you need to specify the sections. And in our case, again, if I open the example building, you will see that the column sections are specified over here. So I have like, for instance, the first two stories W14 by 342, so this is a white flange uh, cross-section based on the, um, in the American uh, uh, cross-section database, white flange cross-section database. And then you have a splice on the third floor, and then the section goes down to W14 by 176, and then you have another splice in the fifth story, and then it goes down to 14 by 68. So this is what I pretty much put here. I start putting the name of the cross-section. Now, you have to be careful here. So the names need to be written based on the integrated database. So actually, if you click on any, when you are starting to add this cross-section, now you have a list that you can select from. So to avoid any uh, problems with the notation. So here you can select, you have all the list of all the cross sections that are incorporated in FM2D and it includes pretty much the sections from the European uh, database and the American database. So in our case, uh, we are selecting uh, W14 by 342. So this is the first story. So this is what I select over here and that's it. Now, if you have a splice, which is the case, so I have, again, I have the first story and second story is the same cross-section. So if I put this on the side, so again, so I have here a splice in the third story. So this means when I go here in my Excel sheet, in the third story, you need to put the larger section. 
so the section before the splice. So in this case, I will put W14 by 342, not W14 by 176. So you always put the one from the story below. And the same thing in axis number two, it's the same as axis number one, so you can copy those uh, twice and that's it, you are done with the mainframe uh, sections. Then uh, you will go to the mainframe beams and again you have the sections of the beams specified over here, W21 by 62, then you go to you say at floor number two, I have a W21 by 62, again you select from the list, I have just one bay, so I just specify uh, the beam sections for one bay only. So you have from floor number two to floor number seven, which is the roof. Uh, for the column splice, again, so you have to tell FM2D if there is a splice at a given story in order to make the appropriate uh, modeling uh, procedures so you specify this using zeros and one so whenever you have a story that doesn't have a splice you just put a zero and if you have a story that has a splice like story number three and story number five you just put a flag identifier of one and then you can also specify the relative location so if your splice is at mid-height, then you just put 0.5, which is what I have right here. But if your splice is at something different, like let's say at one-third of the height of the story, so this is all measured from the bottom floor, so then you can put this as, uh, for instance, 0 0.133, 0 0.133, and so on. So this is the position or the location relative location of uh, the splice within the height of the story. So I will keep this as 0.5 at the mid height as it is. Then you define the doubler plates. So again, doubler plates, if you are not familiar, so doubler plates are uh, additional plates that are welded to the column web panel zone region in order to make it you typically find uh, doubler plates in moment resisting frames uh, but not as much in CBFs or concentric embrace frames uh, so that's why in this case I'm just putting zero so this is pretty much the thickness of these doubler plates if they are present at any floor so I'm specifying zero because I don't have any doubler plates in my case Then, for the gravity uh, framing system columns, so this is the size of the columns of the gravity framing system, and in my case, uh, although it's not shown here uh, in this uh, layout of the building, but pretty much uh, I have these values uh, specified over here, so the first two, three stories, it's W14 by 90, and then it goes to W14 by 82, then W14 by 68. So again, FM2D, the current release, it only considers just one section that's the same at every story. So you cannot have different uh, column, gravity column sizes at the same uh, story. So that's why I don't have here, like for instance, different axes uh, to uh, input. The same things for the gravity beam. So over here I specify the size of the gravity beam uh, in my system at each floor. And then you, after we move from those, then we start going to the braces. So again, the brace, you need to specify the brace cross-section at each story and at each bay number. So again, over here, I see, for instance, that I have an HSS section 12 and half by 0.5, which I already specified over here. So this is a round or a circular uh, hollow structure steel cross-section. 
that's 12.5 inches in diameter and half inches in thickness. So I have all these values at each story of the braces listed over here. If I have again multiple bays, then I will provide the same uh, cross section for the braces at the different bays. And then uh, when it comes to modeling, it's important to define uh, some uh, dimensions related to the uh, gusset plate connections. So this includes here, uh, if I move a little bit over here, so I have the CGP T plate. So CGP refers to the corner gusset plates. So these are the gusset plates at the corners. And you have MGP over here, which is the mid-span gusset plate. So these are the gusset plates that are located at the mid-span of the beam over here. So first, you need to specify the thickness of these gusset plates. How much are they? And if you have this building already designed, then you just need to specify how much is the thickness, again, in the same units of your project. So this is what I do over here at each story. And for the middle gusset plate, again, I will do the same. Then you will need to define some geometric properties to define how these connections look like. So what are these properties and how to specify them? Well, if you go to the manual of a frame modeler, which you can access using the help button, which I will do, I will click on help. So if you click on help, automatically you will have the uh, frame modeler uh, manual uh, automatically opened and actually if you go to the section related to the CBFs which is over here this figure over here let me enlarge it a little bit, a little bit. so you will see that you have some uh, properties that you will need to define you have some properties uh, that you need to define. Uh, these are the uh, offset lens, L offset of the connection, as specified over here. The lens of the connection, L connection. You need to specify these characteristic lenses, L1, L2, L3. And this schematic shows here how to compute pretty much these uh, lenses based on your connection. This is all geometric properties. So this is pretty much what I'm doing over here. So over here, I'm asked to provide for the corner gusset plate, which is this one. I need to provide L1, L2, L3 at each story. So these are the values over here, 11.8 inches, 25 inches, 3.7 inches. So these are the L1, L2, L3 uh, values. And the same thing I do for the middle gusset plate, uh, for the mid-span gusset plate over here, the values for L1, L2, L3. Notice, of course, that L1 and L3 and these values can be can have a negative uh, sign, which is, again, if you refer to the manual and refer to the uh, appropriate reference, again, specified in the manual, you can see, basically, the... Uh, the literature behind these values that has been validated uh, numerically. Now, then you specify for the corner gusset plate again, you need to specify this offset distance, which is the distance from the end of the uh, brace to the center line intersection of the column and beam. So these are the values that I have here. Again, these ones you can get from geometry like if you have your CBF has already been designed so typically you would have some kind of AutoCAD drawing or something of your CBF and then you can deduce or measure directly these values from. Uh, the same things you specify the offset distance for the middle gusset plate and 
Then for the corner gas plate, you specify the length of the connection, which is pretty much the overlap welding over here between the gusset plate and the brace. So again, all in inches. And you specify the same for the middle, for the mid-span uh, gusset plate connection, the length of it. Then you specify the width of the mid-span gusset plate, which is over here, W plate. So this distance. And then you specify the length of the brace, which is the end-to-end -end length of the brace, as specified over here. So I put those here in inches again. And finally, this is a FS profile. This is something that you don't need to worry about. This is something uh, that we are going to go through uh, right now when we go to the other tabs. This is related to the uh, connection between the floor diaphragm and the main frame. But you can leave this one for now. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, the last sheet over here is the section database. So this is the one actually that we were using to select all the different cross sections. So here you have all the list of all the cross sections that are integrated in FM2D. So now we have everything is defined over here. So after you define all these values, you save your Excel sheet and then you just need to browse for it. So if I go here, I say, okay, I save it on the desktop. You just select the file. So now it's telling you, please wait until... And now the data has been imported and processed. And now it says here, if you scroll here, it gives you the location for this file that you just browsed for. And it's in green. So this means that everything is done correctly. So now we're done with the building geometry tab. Then I will go to the supports and connections. Uh, and here... So now we're talking about the supports and the connections. So the first thing uh, that we need to look at is the main frame column supports. So whether your CBF has a pinned support or a fixed support. So I'm selecting here pinned. Uh, then you can specify also the main frame column splice condition. So these splices that you have in the third story and the fifth story should you consider it as fixed splice, so a splice that transfers moment, or you can specify it as pinned, a splice that doesn't transfer moment. So I would consider it here as a fixed uh, splice. Uh, then uh, you can select for the main frame the beam mid-span condition. So you have two options here, free to sag or floor constrained. So what does this mean? So this means in your model, this point at the mid, mid span of the beam, this point in the numerical model, would it be allowed to sag once these braces buckle? Will this point be allowed to sag or not? So this is up to you to define. This, of course, depends on uh, the rigidity and the stiffness of your flooring system, maybe some other considerations that you have. So uh, in my assumption over here, I will specify free to sag. I will allow it to sag. Once the brace buckles, this point can go downward. Uh, then for the main frame, uh, which is the CBF, uh, the beam to column connection. So again, let me open here, let's put it on the side. So you are asked pretty much, what is the uh, type of connection between the beam and the column? And you have the option here to specify different uh, types of connections based on the floor. So for instance, if I have a CB uh, 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 cross bracing layout as the one I, I have over here, so the connection at floor number two and floor number four and floor six could be different.
from the connections at floor 3, floor 5, and floor 7. So this is an option that you have over here in FM2D. So what type of connections can you consider? You can consider a pinned connection, a shear connection, pinned meaning no transferring of moment or uh, no transferring of moment and no rotational stiffness. So it just transfer uh, shear forces. And you have a shear connection. So a shear connection uh, would have, uh, this is a semi-rigid connection pretty much. So it will it transfer uh, some amount of moment and uh, it will have some amount of rotational stiffness. And then you have a moment connection, which is basically a fully rigid connection that transfers moment uh, uh, total, uh, like the total moment of the beam is being transferred. So I will leave the option here. Basically, at the even floors, I can say, for instance, in this connection over here, I can consider it a pinned connection. And maybe on the odd floors, like floor 3, floor 5, because I have a very big uh, beam to column connection, I have the gusset plates, so maybe I can consider this as a moment connection that it's uh, uh, fully rigid. So that's what I do over here. Uh, and then uh, I need to specify the uh, the last thing is the main frame to EGF link connection. So what does this mean? Well, if I open my the manual again, so uh, if you are familiar with the representation of uh, 3D buildings in 2D, so what we typically do, if I have a building like this one over here, uh, we typically uh, idealize it in the 2D as the main frame and an equivalent gravity frame. So the equivalent gravity frame here, or sometimes uh, it can be uh, modeled as a leaning column, if you are familiar with this concept. So the equivalent gravity frame is the same uh, concept as the leaning column, but it's just more general. So the equivalent gravity frame is being used to capture the P delta load of the entire building in the 2D. And in the same time, if you are considering the gravity framing system contributions, the equivalent gravity frame over here will have some strengths and stiffness properties equivalent to the gravity framing system. That's why it's called equivalent gravity frame. So again, in the manual, you can read more about this and you can refer to the uh, literature for more details. So this is the EGF. So what I've been asked over here is pretty much what is the condition of the connection, the link between the main frame and the equivalent gravity frame, which is this link. So in the 2D representation, you have these floor links, the ones in red over here. And you can, in FM2D, you have the option to either specify them as rigid, which is the typical uh, procedure uh, or the typical uh, option that we uh, do in our numerical models, or you can specify it to be flexible. So if it's flexible, this means, again, if you look in the uh, manual, uh, if I go scroll down a little bit, so if you specify this as flexible, then you can assign to it some kind of uh, bilinear uh, behavior that you can specify the properties of this bilinear behavior, this force Fs and this post uh, yield, a sort of say, post yield stiffness Ks. So you can specify those if this is not a rigid link. And you can specify that it has a non-uniform, you can specify even that the profile of this link, how it behaves, it can be different across different floors, uh, where you can specify this FS profile from the Excel sheet. So this is so from the Excel file, sorry. So this is the last sheet that we looked over here, the last sheet relating to uh, the FS profile. So this is where this comes from. So in our case, I will just assume a rigid link. Uh, 
So this is typically captures the flexibility of the floor diaphragm and the nature of the connection between the floor diaphragm and the main frame. Then, and now I'm done with the support and connections, then I will select the loads and materials. So here I will need to specify the loads, the uniform area loads. The units is kip per inch square. So you have three types of load are being considered in FM2D. The dead load, the live load, and the cladding load. So the cladding load is pretty much the loading on the facade of the building. So this is the cladding load. Or all of them are uh, uniform area loads. So in my uh, example building, I'm assuming that I have a dead load of 90 uh, pound per square feet. So you just need to transform this 90 pound per square feet to uh, keep per square inch. So this gives me actually 6.25 E negative 4. And the same thing on the roof. So again, 6.25 E negative 4. As for the live load, I'm assuming that I have 50 uh, pound per square feet, per square foot of the typical story, which it translates to 3.47 E negative 4 kip per inch square. And for the roof, it's a little bit less. It's just only 20 pound per square foot, which translates to 1.39 E negative 4. For the cladding, I'm assuming 25 pound per square foot uh, facade load. So this translates to 1.74 E negative 4. So these are the loads that I'm specifying here. Now, in the numerical model, two types of load or mass quantities are being uh, computed. There is the seismic weight, which are basically the loads that are going to be applied to your building. And there is the mass, which will be considered in the in excitation and the inertia forces. So I'm here, I'm selecting the default values. And the default values, if I unselect this, I can change these values. So the default values that I'm using in my combination, for the seismic weight, I'm using 1.05 of the dead load plus 1.05 of the cladding load, which is, again, another type of dead load, pretty much, plus 1 quarter or 0.25 of the live load. For the seismic mass, or for the mass for the inertia forces, I'm only considering the dead loads only. So that's why I have here the coefficient for the live load as 0, and the coefficients for the cladding and the dead load equal to 1. So this is the default, but of course you can change these values if you like to. So I will select default values to keep them as it is. Now for the materials, the last thing you need, after we define the loads, we also define the materials. So for the material, you will need pretty much to specify the modulus of elasticity, the yield stress, Fy, and the uh, Poisson ratio mu. And these are all done in KSI unit, again, keep inch, keep per inch square. Uh, and over here you have multi you have uh, actually a material database that you can select from. So you have here some European uh, steel material like S355. You have the uh, American steel material like A992 grade 50. Uh, you have others from the Chinese uh, standard. So you have all these options to choose from. The high strength steel as well, like S690 and so on. You can select any type of material from those and it will automatically update these values accordingly. Here I'm using, I can use uh, the user defined uh, or any other one, this is not a problem. So I'll just keep it like user defined uh, and I specify the values for E, P, 
values uh, is for Fy. Here you have three values for Fy. So the first one is for the general beam and columns. The second one, if you have a different uh, yield stress for the brace element. And you can also specify if you have a different yield stress for the gusset plate. Because sometimes uh, the gusset plates come from a different steel uh, type or grade uh, compared to the uh, other members. So you can specify all three values over here. The next thing is the member uh, modeling. So this is some uh, options that you can control uh, regarding the uh, modeling of your member. So when it comes to the main frame column elements, so these ones, so you can model the columns as elastic beam columns. So these are elastic beam columns that have rotational springs at their end or you can specify them to be a displacement-based fiber with fiber cross-sections or a force-based uh, beam columns with a fiber cross-section. Uh, over here, I would select actually uh, fiber, uh, like a displacement-based beam columns with a fiber cross-section. You can also specify here for the braces and the columns as well. You can specify how you model the fiber-based elements. Uh, by default, these are the values that I'm using by default. So for the number of segments along the length of the member, I'm dividing it, the member, into eight segments. And this is for the number of integration points per segment. So by default, I'm using five. So these are all values that has been recommended in literature based on sensitivity studies and calibrations. And finally, you can specify the global mid-length imperfection as a percentage of the length of the member. So typically, we use 1 over 1,000, again, based on calibration. The recommended value is 1 over 1,000 of the length of the member. Uh, the last option over here, which is deactivated, actually. So this option uh, has to do with... Uh, the PM interaction consideration for the main frame columns. So right now, since we have a fiber-based element for the main frame columns, so this means that the PM interaction is uh, explicitly considered because this is a fiber section. So the PM interaction, the axial load bending moment interaction, is considered. However, if you are using an elastic beam column, then the flexure strength of the member when you are defining the properties for the rotational springs will need to be reduced depending on how much axial load does the member experience. So that's why if you select elastic beam column then you will be given the option, uh, pretty much you have two options, how to compute this p-value that will be used to reduce the plastic moment of the column. So you can do this based on the gravity load multiplied by scale factor. So basically, uh, FM2D will compute the gravity load on this column, only gravity, and then it will multiply it by some kind of scale factor that you specify, and then it will use this as part of the PM interaction formula to reduce the plastic moment capacity of the column. Or, Sometimes in literature, we do this based on the pushover analysis. So what we do is that we use the gravity load, but we add to it half of the maximum axial load, compressive axial load, that is being experienced when you do a pushover analysis. So this is again discussed in detail in the uh, manual, so I will not go through it in detail over here, but you can see the uh, theory behind it and the equations used to do that. So you can specify this option if you want to. Uh, so right now, I don't care. I will not use this or that because I'm, as we said, I'm selecting a fiber debased uh, uh, element. So this is done uh, explicitly. I don't do. I don't need to do 
this PM interaction thing implicitly because I don't have rotational springs in my columns. So now I'm done with all the building uh, parameters. So I will just need to go ahead and click Submit. So once you click Submit, so now the button turns green and right now it says six story CBF X brace. Uh, and uh, right now the analysis parameter uh, button has been activated. So this is the next step pretty much to define the analysis parameters. In the same time, these two buttons have been activated. So the first one, it says get period. And actually, if I click on this one, this will quickly give me do a quick calculation and a quick eigenvalue analysis and it will give me the period of my structure the seismic weight and the seismic uh, and the mass so if i click on that so now observe what happens so here in the command shell window you can see here uh, over here you can see the background that's why this command shell uh, this window over here is very useful because you can see everything that has been running in the background like the open seas run you can see the period uh, you can see everything happening here so if if any problem happens then you will see it in this window and over here automatically the program ran this analysis in the background and right now actually you have this result folder that has been created in the desktop and if you open it, you will see that inside it, there is an eigenvalue analysis folder that includes this quick analysis that has been conducted for the eigen analysis. And over here, it says in the status bar, it says T1 is 1.07 seconds for my structure. The mass is 16.7 kip second square per inch. And the seismic weight WS is 7503 kip. So this is just a quick analysis that we conducted just to check uh, the properties of our model because of course if you get a period that something that doesn't make sense or something that seems fishy then you can uh, go back and check maybe your building properties or your loads uh, or your values maybe if you did a mistake. In the same time, if you want to check the definitions, uh, instead of going to uh, opening each module and looking again, you can click on the scope parameter, uh, scope button, sorry, over here, that says that will show you a summary of the definition. So if I click on that, so over here it will open the project summary. So here it shows me all the details of my structure. So like the file names, the numerical model description, what we considered and what we didn't consider, uh, the building data, the number of stories, number of frames, the tributary areas, the loads, the combinations. So everything that we have defined so far, it's being listed in this project summary and it's very, very useful, of course. So I would close that. So everything seems fine and then the next thing that I will do is to define the analysis parameters. So I will click on analysis parameters. So this is what type of analysis we are going to do now that our building has been defined. So in my case over here for this example, I will be using... Uh, you have different types of analysis, of course. Pushover analysis, eigenvalue analysis. IDA, incremental dynamic analysis, uh, your typical dynamic response history analysis using a target scale factor or using a target intensity. You can do an equivalent lateral force analysis as well. So in our case, I will use a response history analysis. I have a set of ground motions that I will apply them to my building and I will scale all these ground motions using a target scale factor. So I will select this option uh, you have some options here for the run that you are going to uh, conduct. If you want to show the animation, so you can select this. So this will show you the animation from open seas of the deformed shape. You can put the scale factor for the deformed shape. By default here is 5. This is the window size in pixels.
for the window size that will show the deformed shape. So again, these are the default values. You can click, uh, you can select this option if you want to show the open seas status. So pretty much what's happening in the background, uh, all the conversions, iterations and everything. So you can select this if you want to uh, see it and it will appear over here. Uh, maximum runtime, this is pretty much uh, uh, in, in some cases when you have a convergence problem, if you have a convergence problem, then uh, you might get into a, a loop of iterations that doesn't uh, end pretty much and this can cause the analysis to go forever. So that's why I typically specify a maximum runtime so this is per ground motion per one analysis so you can specify this like for instance like 10 minutes <clears throat> or five minutes or whatever it depends of course on how fast is your pc and how big is your model uh, so typically i think 10 minutes would be a reasonable one uh, in reasonable uh, amount of time so if the analysis for just one ground motion takes more than 10 minutes then the program will automatically stop it and just move into the next ground motion. Uh, so this is very useful, especially if you're running something overnight and you're running uh, a very large set of ground motions and you don't want to leave it running overnight and come the next morning to find it stalling at, at a specific record. So this is very, very useful. Uh, the last option is to include modeling uncertainty. Uh, and this is one of the very good, uh, very strong aspects actually of FM2D. Uh, when FM2D is creating a numerical model, uh, you are creating, uh, you are specifying the properties for nonlinear springs, for uh, uh, elastic beam column elements, etc. So. So you have the option to include the uncertainty because these values, when you compute these values, like moment rotation response, for instance, when you are computing some of these values, uh, there could be some uncertainty associated with these values because these values are typically obtained through regression analysis using empirical equations. So there is some kind of uncertainty or variability with these values. So you can include this over here, like you can go to the define, uh, you can say include modeling uncertainty, and then you can go to define, and from this, so now it's waiting for my input, and then you can say, uh, for instance, for the different material models that are being used in uh, FM2D, you can specify the standard deviation the logarithmic standard deviation associated with each of these modeling parameters. So for instance, when you are computing the elastic stiffness for the IMK by lean material model for the columns, you might want to say that, okay, consider a standard deviation, logarithmic standard deviation of 0.1 as uncertainty with this parameter. So you can do that, of course, for for different things and you can do this as well even for the material the damping the other parameters and uh, uh, I will be keep adding additional parameters to those as well that you can uh, assign uncertainty to I will not do this here uh, to be honest I will just answer like that but if you do that what will happen is that after you execute the analysis so randomly these values based on this distribution that you specified it will be generated and automatically a number of realization of your model will be analyzed so you will get for each ground motion you will have some kind of distribution of uh, output data or structural response data not just a single value so this is something uh, to consider if you're running some kind of uh, modeling uncertainty study or uh, reli reliability study for instance or something related to modeling uh, sensitivity so you can consider this option so now since we selected dynamic uh, analysis that we want to do response history analysis so 
The second tab, which is the push over equivalent lateral force parameters, this is deactivated because this is not what we are doing. So that's why this tab is deactivated. So I don't need to define anything here. Dynamic parameters. Now here I will need some uh, fields are deactivated because I don't need to specify those, but the rest you can specify. So you can choose first the intensity measure. So we have two types of intensity measure currently incorporated in FM2D. You have the spectral acceleration at the first mode period of the structure, T1, which is computed here at 1.07, and SA average, which is the average spectral acceleration for a period range. So you can specify uh, which intensity measure you want. I will use SAT1 for simplicity. Uh, then you can specify the scaling period. So, the, so in our case, I will just use 1.07, similar to the period of the structure. And then since we specified that we want to do a target scale factor, so I'm applying a constant scaling factor for all the ground motion records to apply them. So you can just specify this scale factor. So I will actually use a scale factor of 1. So you can use any, any scale factor that you want, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 3, 4, up to you. So I will just keep it as 1. So just apply the ground motion records as they are. Uh, here you can specify the collapse drift limit. So once the analysis is being conducted, if the ground motion is strong enough and your building uh, deteriorates and it fails, so this can happen due to the cyclic deterioration and the large P delta uh, forces in your structure, it can collapse. Or you can also specify a drift limit. So this is a collapse criteria, additional collapse criteria. So by default, this is 15% radian. So if the story drift, if the story drift reaches 15% radian, so this means collapse uh, has been reached and just stop the analysis and mark it as collapse has been, uh, has occurred. So I will leave it as it is. So that's it for the damping parameters. The other fields are only, uh, available for the other types of uh, analysis procedures, which is described in other tutorials in details. Now for the damping, so again, really damping model is being incorporated in FM2D. And here you need to specify the Rayleigh periods. So first you specify the damping ratio, which here I'm I have it at 2% for steel buildings. You can make it 5%, 3%. This is, again, you can specify this value. And you specify the two periods at which this damping ratio is, uh, uh, is set. So I'm using the first and third uh, mode period for my six-story building. So that's fine. I will keep it as it is. The last thing that you need to define is, uh, not the last thing, sorry, the just one before last. So this is the ground motion data. So you need to have the ground motion folder. You need to browse for it. And I actually have it over here in the desktop. So this is provided with the support documents uh, for uh, FM2D on GitHub. But again, you can have any, uh, any folder that has any set of ground motions that you can create. So what does this folder contain? Well, this folder, it contains the, the different uh, records. It contains the different records, so different text files for each record. So these are all text files. If I open them, they contain the acceleration data in units of G. So these are all the acceleration history in units of G. And in the same time, in the same folder, this folder contains 44 records. So this is the far field records from FEMA P695. Uh, P, uh, and you have another uh, folder as, as, sorry, text file that's called all GM info that need to be inside this folder. So this one pretty much includes the name of each ground motion. So for instance, ground motion record 120111, 
this one and so it has two columns the name of the ground motion and the delta t of the sampling pretty much of the data inside it so 0.01 second 0.05 seconds and so on so you need to have this data organized like this and then you just need to browse for the folder so i will go to desktop i will select the ground motion folder say select folder it says please wait so now it's processing the data it's saving the data and storing them so you can give it like a few seconds until it's done and now it's done now it turns green and here it's it gives you the path to the uh, ground motion folder and now it's done and automatically here the ground motion records it says the number automatically has been updated to 44 of course, you can consider how many ground motion records you want to run. So in this case, I will just uh, run uh, 10 uh, of these records. I will not run the full 44 records. I will just run a subset of these records just to demonstrate for this example. So I will just run uh, 10 records. Uh, and you can specify also the free vibration time so at the end of each record you can specify the amount of free vibration at the end so you can leave some free vibration to let the building uh, come to rest after the application of the ground motion so typically this is like 10 seconds uh, of free vibration that people add to the ground motion uh, for this example, I'm, I don't really care about the free vibration because this is just an example for illustration. So I will just put it as zero second so that the analysis can finish faster. Then you can also specify the analysis time step. So this is the delta T for the analysis. Uh, typically, you can take this as like half or one quarter of the ground motion time step. So this is up to you, of course. So if you use it one quarter, you will just put 0.25 of the time step. Of course, this means that it will take a bit longer to run the analysis. Uh, here, by default, I'm using 0.5 of the GM time step. And actually, just to make things go faster, I will just make it at 1. So the delta T for the analysis, I will make it the same as the delta T for the ground motion, just to make things go faster. But you can control this as well. The last thing to define is the recorders. What kind of data you want to record and to be saved in the results, which can be visualized or reported later on. So by default, the time vector is going to be saved, the analysis time, uh, the storage drift ratio, the support reactions, and the floor acceleration. And the column element forces so these are by default are selected but you can select pretty much everything you can save column spring data you can save the floor link force deformation fd data the panel zone so you can select pretty much anything that you want from here uh, for now i will select the brace force deformation because this is important to see uh, maybe the corner gusset plate forces as well uh, so that's it I will leave those as they are but you can select any of these ones or maybe the ones that you pretty much need to record and that's it so this is done I will click submit so now once the three pieces components of my project has been defined the only thing remaining is to run the model so by clicking run the model the FM2D in the background will start running, uh, creating the TSL files for the OpenSeas, running the analysis, and I will show some, it will show some uh, uh, output uh, information of what's happening in the background. So I will go ahead and click run model, and we'll see after the analysis is done. Notice here when I click run model, so right now I have, as we specified, I have the deformation window over here, showing over here. 
So this is the default shape and I can see the analysis happening. In the status bar, it says running dynamic analysis, ground motion number one at increment number one, scale factor equal to one. So this is just to keep an eye on the uh, progress status. Over here, it says uh, uh, ground motion uh, number one, the ground motion name, the ground motion peak ground acceleration, the ground motion uh, SAT1 value, uh, the ground motion delta T, the ground motion duration. So this is also another thing that you can keep an eye for what's going on uh, in the background. So notice here that once uh, the analysis uh, one ground motion is done, you will see here that you have this scope uh, window over here that pretty much shows you for each ground motion. Now we have 10 ground motions, so I have from 1 to 10. And then it will show you the scatter of the maximum story drift ratio that has been recorded. So right now I have ground motion number one has been uh, finished, so I have the value for the maximum story drift ratio, which is about 1.8% uh, percent radian, and you have here the peak floor acceleration, which uh, recorded peak floor acceleration, which is about uh, 0.6 uh, uh, G. So this scope, you can, uh, this is a very good uh, uh, option that you can uh, pretty much keep an eye on the important global engineering demand parameters, EDPs, uh, that are being recorded uh, through the analysis. So the every ground motion that once every ground motion is finished, you will see a new scatter point coming into this uh, <clears throat> into this uh, scope uh, plot uh, until the analysis is finished. So now that the analysis is concluded, so now the program is uh, saying right here that it's saving the summary uh, data. So these are all summary files that are being, the data are being processed and summary files are being saved inside the results folder. So it might take uh, like a few seconds. So now it says done, the analysis time, the total analysis time is 73 minutes. So this is for running 10 ground motions. So this is about seven minutes per ground motion record, uh, which is again, this has to do with the, uh, the length or the duration of each ground motion, how big is your model. So many, many parameters uh, comes uh, into this, but anyway, uh, so again, here you can see the distribution, as we said, for the story drift and peak floor acceleration for the 10 ground motion records, but we can uh, visualize these data, these data more uh, using the visualize option. So I will go ahead and close this one. Uh, quickly, if you go into the results folder, so now if I go inside the result folder, so you can see the 10 subfolders for each of the 10 ground motion records that has been analyzed. If you go inside each one you will see the all the record there the recorded uh, responses for the different elements based on what we have selected so this is all the recorded data and over here you see this summary uh, data that has been generated and processed by FM2D so for instance the summary this is a summary of the maximum story drift ratio so if you open that you will see here uh, six columns of data for each story. So story one, story two, story three, story four, story five, story six. Uh, and you can see the value of the story drift for the number of rows is for the 10 
ground motion so for each ground motion i can get the values of the story if that each story so this is a summarized uh, data and the same you have uh, the same file for the peak flow acceleration and you have for the residual story drift or rdr so i will minimize this now and then let's go into the visualization uh, module so i click on visualize so this is the visualization options uh, some of them are deactivated uh, like the ida Plots. These are deactivated because we didn't run an IDE analysis. Uh, but you can look at uh, several things. So, for instance, here you can look at the eigen uh, vectors uh, profile. So, if I select this one and I click plot, just give it a few seconds to uh, process the data. So, here you can see the profiles of the uh, uh, eigenvectors plotted for mode 1 up till mode uh, 5 so over here you can see the mode periods and you can see the mode profiles the black one is the first mode uh, vector and so on uh, you can check the for instance the peak story drift ratio so these are the profile so you can check the profile plots so here I will plot this for ground motion 1 to 10 you can specify here that if you just want to plot for the first record, so just put this one to one. For the second record, you can put two. But if you want to plot all of them, so you can say from one to ten, and you can say plot. And here, this is very quickly, so now you can see the profile of the story drift ratio along the building height, and you can see the median profile as well, superimposed on the ten individual profiles you can do the same for the peak floor acceleration like here you can see the uh, profile of the peak floor acceleration uh, you can do this for the peak floor velocity for the peak story shear force so if I do that again it will take some time until the data is processed So here you go. So now you can see the profile of the story shear force normalized by the seismic weight, WS, and the median. So you can see this. So it's about, at the base, it's about 0.18 of the seismic weight. Uh, you can look at the uh, base shear force versus the first story drift. So this is the of the building. Uh, let's just do this for ground motion record number one to see how it looks like. So if I click plot, so here you go. You can see the base shear force, the normalized base shear force versus the first story drift ratio. So you can see it like this. Uh, most importantly, you can also visualize uh, the fragility data. Uh, so uh, again you can look at the fragility curves so if I put like for the 10 records if I click on the fragility curves so you will get three curves for the peak floor acceleration the residual drift and the story drift so you can see the fragility curves uh, for the data fitted with the log normal cumulative distribution function uh, most importantly if you want to look at the individual uh, or the local member responses so you can select this option over here and you can specify which ground motion you want to investigate so i will put ground motion number one and i will click plot so it will open this interactive interface and from this you can uh, scroll between the different uh, elements, column springs, floor rings, all the things that we have recorded. Uh, you can go through, like for instance, if I'm looking at the brace element, here I'm showing the axial force versus the story drift, uh, where I'm at, story drift I. Uh, you can look at the uh, normalized axial force, axial displacement, so you can see here how the, that the brace buckled uh, at one point, and you can see the hysteresis for it. You can go to different stories, 
uh, you can look at any brace like the left brace or the right brace so this is very very uh, useful to do there are many plot types that you can look at uh, you can look at for instance the panel zone spring how it behaves so you can look at the relation between the moment in the spring of the panel zone and the shear distortion uh, you can look at the column spring behavior at any location so the top spring at the ground level you can look at like floor number two so this is again you are looking at moment rotation uh, so it's very very useful what you can do here but you can investigate pretty much any of the data that you have recorded uh, if you have any uh, data that you want to save you can click on save data here and then it will automatically save the XY data of this plot inside the results folder so that you can use it externally so this concludes uh, our uh, 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 example tutorial today on CBF uh, modeling and how we can visualize the results and do the analysis I hope you find it useful. If you have any additional information, you can uh, any additional. If you have any additional questions, you can refer to the uh, program manual. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you can refer to the uh, to the uh, software manual from the help over here. You can click on help, and you can go to the software manual. Uh, if, the, you can, if there is something that you can find in the manual and uh, you can always email me uh, and I will be happy to respond. Thank you very much for your attention.